Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Today, we're going to be live podcasting a taping of The Catch. I'd like to start by thanking Foreign Policy Magazine and the Walton Family Foundation for hosting the event. Um, I'm Rebecca Hubbard, the director of the High Seas Alliance. The Catch is Foreign Policy's global fisheries podcast, and they've covered fish issues all over the world, from Peru to Mexico, Mexico and recently in Norway. So if you haven't listened yet to the podcast, it's extremely interesting, pull out your phone and go to Apple or Spotify and hit follow. And just to give you a sneak peek, we're going to show the trailer for season three now. For thousands of years, the codfish in the Norwegian Arctic has led a very predictable life. Migrating south from the Barents Sea, passing the coastal communities of Finnmark and Trums, and eventually making its way to the warm spawning grounds of Lofoten, which juts out into the Norwegian Sea. This annual pilgrimage has made fishing a way of life and a vital piece of Norway's economy. The country exports nearly 3 million tons of seafood a year. Cod is second only to salmon. But in recent years, the fish in Norway have started acting strange. Climate change is warming the waters, causing cod and other species to start showing up in places they hadn't before. This adds to tension as Norway deals with its big next door neighbor, Russia. Hi, I'm Ruxandra Guidi, host of The Catch, a podcast from foreign policy about the seafood we eat and the impact it can have on our world. This season, I'm packing up my parka and mittens and heading to Norway, a place so far north it's known as the land of the midnight sun. There, I'll get a first-hand look at the country's cod fishery and how Norwegians are balancing negotiations with Russia during these not-so-peaceful times. I'll also learn about negotiations going on inside Norway between big fishing vessels and the indigenous Semi people. As always, I'll be speaking directly with stakeholders, ranging from conservationists to politicians, to commercial and local fishers, on what this all means for their lives and livelihoods. And we'll see what Norway's handling of the cod situation says about fisheries in other parts of the world, that are changing their migration patterns. That's all coming up on season three of The Catch, coming to you in November. Okay, so today we're going to continue some of these conversations that started with the Norwegian uh, example, particularly around how warming waters are changing the habitats and migratory patterns of fish and how that impacts our fisheries management and potentially creates conflicts between neighbouring countries, communities and even larger geopolitics. So before I introduce our esteemed panel, I'd just like to give a little bit more background about the discussion. According to scientists, over half of the world's fish populations are likely to move from their historic habitats by the end of the century. As I said, this will increase pressure on existing management practices and potentially cause tensions. And we're going to explore what kinds of tensions today that that can create. These conflicts are not actually new though. Between the end of World War II and the collapse of the Soviet Union, a quarter of the world's conflicts were about fish. Who knew that fish were so important and contentious? So this doesn't just matter for the communities that are fishing, but it also directly impacts citizens, consumers, and particularly because fish and seafood products are amongst the most traded commodities in the world. So it, it's really a real connector uh, globally. So let's get started. I am delighted and honoured to introduce our panellists. First, we have Director Manuel Varange, the Ed Director of Food and Agriculture Organisations, Fisheries and Aquaculture Division. 
Sarah Glasser is the Senior Director of the Oceans Futures Program at World Wildlife Fund. Rashid Sumaila, uh, at University Killam Professor at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries in the University of British Columbia. And Dr. Manu Dupao Rosen, Director General from the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency. Thank you all for joining us. So we're just going to start with the basics. It's always a good place to start. Sarah, if you could tell us a little bit about your research, which has really focused on fisheries conflicts around the world. Why do fish cause so many problems? And how big is the problem really? Well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll answer that question with three examples that I've learned about in my career uh, researching the causes of fisheries conflict. And I'm a tuna biologist by training, and I started in this field when I was working with a colleague of mine who I happened to be married to. Um, and we looked at causes of conflict and the result of conflict in northern Uganda. And what happened was during a civil conflict that took place in the mid-2000s, people fled that conflict, and they relocated around Lake Victoria. And Lake Victoria has a massive freshwater fishery for three main types of fish, Nile perch, Nile tilapia, and a little small fish um, that's primarily used for feed for agriculture. And when people moved, they started fishing. And that's because Lake Victoria has an open access fishery. Anyone can fish if they can find a net and they can fish in the nearshore waters or join a boat crew. Um, and we looked at the effect of that on catch of fish and actually pressure in Uganda that then trickled over to a disputed island um, in between the border of Uganda and Kenya. And we found increased military activity between the Ugandans and the Kenyans over access to this island that was a really important fish breeding ground. And then likewise, that caused greater pressure on that fish population, which then started to decline. So the cycle really reinforces itself. Um, and the second example I'll give is a different type of conflict, and that is the role of fishing vessels, foreign fishing vessels, accessing waters illegally and causing conflict either through violent interactions with domestic and local fisheries um, or through greater fishing pressure. And this occurred off the Horn of Africa in Somalia, and it was one of the contributors to widespread piracy in the region. And the third is more recently working at WWF and looking at what's happening in Ecuador and in particular the waters around the Galapagos. And there's a lot of interaction between um, crime, organized crime syndicates and drug cartels and the fishing industry, which drives violence against fishers. It also impacts um, endangered species through greater risk of wildlife trafficking. And so the bottom line is that there are lots of different causes of conflict. It happens at many different scales. And I think we're going to see increasing risk of conflict as fish populations decline and move, as you've already mentioned. Excellent. Thank you. It's really nice uh, painting of the diverse picture, actually. There are different... The, the range of conflicts is really fascinating. Manuel, you work um, at a global level, responsible for fisheries management, policies and, and you know, approaches. How have these conflicts played out in your work and at the FAO level? Um, certainly play up in our work and not just in the fisheries work, in all the food systems work. So the conflicts that Sarah mentioned, that are very, they are very relevant and very real, they are also in other sectors. Um, but we have some as well in, not in places where there is conflict and the conflict that uh, associated, is associated with fisheries is a result of a previous conflict, but conflict that arises simply because things move and countries don't have systems to manage something that is moving. So I will add another example, you know, in the North Atlantic, the, the, the herring, um, blue whiting and mackerel that is shared between the European Union that has authority over the waters of Euro European waters in the Atlantic, Norway and Iceland and the Faroe Islands. And they all agree on a science-based maximum catch limit, but they don't agree on to how much, what percentage of that catch should be to each one of them. And if you don't have an arrangement 
um, to negotiate that and agree what that percentage is and whether this percentage needs to change if things change in the water, then conflict arises. So nothing underlying it, just simply changes in the ocean. So how do we deal with this in, in FAO is, well, FAO is really the only neutral body where fisheries issues can be discussed by countries. Um, and every two years, all the countries come to FAO and discuss all these issues. They create subcommittees to discuss specifically uh, areas of more conflict. And we have a, a new subcommittee on fisheries management exclusively to work on fisheries management that will start a, a work in January. And there, all the countries bring the issues. And the FAO provides uh, attempted solutions to the challenges that they have. And then they decide and negotiate what the best solutions are. But at the end of the day, um, everything in life has to be negotiated, right? Everything is a trade-off, whether it is who picks up the children or who, you know, who drives home first and cooks supper to actually who actually fishes and what percentage. So the negotiations have to be to, have to take place, and sometimes they are very difficult negotiations, and conflict arises just from that. But we should not be afraid of conflict. We should not be afraid of the fact that these challenges are there. What we should be afraid is if we think that we don't have the ability to provide solutions. And in fisheries, I think that we do have that ability. I couldn't agree with you more. I think, um, so we're, gonna, we're going to continue through this conversation. We might return back to a couple of themes. Um, if I can turn to you, Rashid, you come from West Africa but you studied and worked in Norway, now in Canada, you've worked all over the world. Um, and so you have a very global view across science, economics, fisheries management, policy making. It's really a, an exceptional perspective. Are there other types of conflicts or from your experience, is there anything that you'd like to highlight in terms of the kinds of conflicts that you've seen? We're not going to solutions just yet, just if you can describe for people to, so that they can understand. Oh, it's working, right? Yeah. So conflict. Mm. Com conflict is always there, right? The potential of it is always there. But the way we structure our systems and our lives will actually can, can reduce conflict and can help us deal with it. So that's a starting point. But looking around, you know, you, the, the movie starting with court. I, that's what I started studying in, in, in Norway. You know, I've always been this guy. When, when, the wave, when the wave is going that way, I go that way, right? So when I was in Norway, fellow Africans, you know, all of them, during summer, they said, we've got to go home and study our thing. So they go home, and I said, no, I'm in Norway. I'm going to study Norwegian thing, you know? And so court was one of the first things I studied. And uh, what we looked at, we applied game theory, actually. So in conflict, you have games coming into play, right? So you have different parties, they have their interests. And when things shift, this interest shift, and that leads to conflict. So Norway and Russia, even during the Soviet Union, they worked together to share the court and in a way that is beautiful, actually. They forgot all the big, big global fights, political and solve the problem of the people on the ground. But now with climate change, things are happening like you have seen. So a stable system like that can be disrupted. The fish moves, but the people don't move easily. Fish don't need visa, they go, right? So, but people can follow their fish, and so that's a point of conflict. And, and the Norwegian example is one. Then when you go to Namibia, South Africa, and, and, and Angola, they share the Benguela system, and that's another possibility. Fortunately, they have formed a joint man management system to try to deal with this. But the, so that has not flared up, even though with climate change this can be this can be serious. Then finally, the South China Sea. That's a place we have studied a lot, and there are about how many sixteen countries. William, you are sitting there fishing in that place, very contentious politically with China. The big, the big brother and all the others, right? And there we see potential for conflict really increasing due to climate change, but food security issues and the political issues. You know, when you start putting structures in the system to claim it, then you lead to more, more struggles. So these are three quick examples for you. Great. Thanks, Rashid. Manu, if I could go to you next, because I think it's, it's nice to get these examples from different 
parts of the world, right? Because obviously these conflicts are arising and in different ways for different region, regions. Um, so in the Pacific, in the Pacific um, a region filled with small island developing states or what we would, I would prefer to call the large, island, large ocean nations, um, you have long ties with the ocean and fisheries, obviously, with so much ocean territory. How are the people in the Pacific region feeling the impacts um, of climate change and the, the influences on fisheries management decisions? How is that being felt at an individual level in, in the Pacific? Are you, have you already got people in, in the fishing community there that are already experiencing that? And can you explain what that looks like for people. Thank you, Rebecca, and it's a privilege to be on this esteemed panel with our colleagues here. And, you know, when, when we talk about the Pacific, we think about ocean. We are 96% ocean. And so I, I do agree with the way that you recharacterize our Pacific countries as large ocean uh, coastal states. We are over 30 million square meters of ocean in terms of our exclusive economic zones. We house over 20% of the world's EEZs. So, you know, we've got a, a privilege and responsibility with maintaining the health of our stocks. And it's the largest tuna fishery in the world. And I say that um, with the latest data that came in last year with the catch at nearly 3 million metric tons of tuna harvested in our waters, with a catch value, landed value, of nearly six billion US dollars. And that is significant for our region. When we think about their food security, their livelihood, the economic development, we also think about the um, really important government revenue earner through tuna fisheries, with over 480 million US dollars a year uh, through government revenue from tuna fisheries. And for five of our member countries, it provides more than 40% of government revenue. So it's, it's in terms of uh, climate change impacts, it's a significant impact. And, and I say that not just from a national and regional level, but also from a global level, because this fishery provides from our 17 member countries' waters a third of the world's global supply of tuna. So it's significant for all of us, these types of impacts. And what the science is telling us is that it will impact both in terms of distribution and abundance of our, our tuna stocks. So the predictions of a shift from the Western Central Pacific Ocean, which houses most of our countries, to the Eastern Pacific Ocean. The, the prediction also of tuna biomass shift from within our exclusive economic zones into high seas. And if we stay with a high emission scenario, that is up to 20% loss in terms of that tuna biomass from our waters into the high seas, which is significant. If we get back on track, and that is a clear message we've heard in COP, that we must get back on track with achieving 1.5. If we can do that, the loss is reduced from 20% to 3%, and it's still a loss and is still a very significant issue for us in the region. So, you know, I did want to talk about conflict and, and I'll, I'll wait till you give an opportunity for that and a message from us in the Pacific. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. I think um, we'll just keep exploring it for a bit further before we move into the solutions because I always like to put a lot of effort into the solutions and because as Manuel said, there's challenges, there's conflicts, but there is opportunities to negotiate our way out of this, right? It's, this, this is what we're all here for, in fact, even here at the climate conference. We're trying to get a solution. Um, but I'm, I d would just like to touch on that point that you did mention then, Manu, is like as a, a small island developing state or as developing states, you know, um, how is the conflict and, and the impact being felt differently compared to for developed countries, the more richer global north, what, what's the difference in experience? Can you, you know, it's obviously a big, a big difference for you. It's a huge impact on your, on your economic uh, independence and, and capacity. Did you want to talk about that any further? 
Thank you, Rebecca. And, you know, I'll put it in this way, and I'll use the example of women in the tuna fishery sector. Women provide, uh, in terms of employment, they, they provide over 70% of those employed in this sector. And at present, it's over 26,000 people in the Pacific. So there's a huge proportion of women that are employed, especially in processing and marketing. And when COVID hit, you know, these are income earners for their families. And when COVID hit and there was a short supply of tuna into um, canneries for the processing, for marketing, onto shore, uh, it did impact everyday livelihoods for these women. And I use that as an example of, of where it can really hit home for the everyday consumer, for the everyday Pacific Islander. And if we think about climate change and the types of impacts that is predicted, it can have the same effects as well. Not just those in a commercial sense, but especially those who uh, provide food for their tables. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, Manuel, just um, continuing on, on that line, at the FAO, what, um, how else are you dealing with this issue at a, at a global level in terms of management? And, and what are the, some of the ways that, um, that, it's, that it's showing up for you? Right, so I think <clears throat> maybe we'll need to move into how are fisheries manage, managed? So where does the conflict start? And, 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 but first picking up on what has been said so far to realize that there is conflict because fish matters, right? It's not because of any other reason, because it provides food, it provides jobs, it provides economic development, it matters. So that's where the conflict arises. Now, the, the ocean is regulated on the basis that the first 200 miles from the coast, the exclusive economy zones, are managed by the countries of the coast that have that coastline. That is, as per the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. By the way, they have an, also an obligation to exploit the resources. If they don't, landlocked countries have preference to exploit those resources. So that area is exploited by um, the coastal uh, state. They can share those resources. They can sell the rights to fish to other countries, but that's what they, they manage. Then the area beyond that is managed in two different ways. One is through regional fisheries management organizations. Uh, these are organizations where uh, coastal states and long distance fleets get together, agreed on the rules uh, of um, a procedure, and then uh, go through the exploitation of the resources with their own scientific systems and their own mechanisms for management and al allocation of the resources. That is the second very important. The third one is the high seas that are not regulated under um, and, and the, uh, a regional arrangement or under national arrangement. Those areas are managed in very different ways. In some, some areas there is no management. Uh, countries have a right to exploit those resources. In some cases, they have to apply the same rules that they apply in their waters because of their own legislation, so it's very patchy. So what we do in FAO, first of all, is try to provide the most clear normative principles at the global level, agreements that everyone makes um, so that they apply by in their waters and in international waters. An example, Port States Measures Agreement, uh, which is perhaps the latest, um, but there are so many. Uh, fisheries is a very is a highly regulated industry. Um, there's a fallacy to say that fisheries is not regulated. It's very, very regulated. Um, and in the, uh, the Port States Measures Agreement, those that signed the agreement agreed to share information on vessels that enter their ports, um, uh, information on their catches, information of where they've been, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of regulation in that way, and we negotiated with countries in, in FAO. We also support countries individually and collectively in the regional fisheries management organizations to help them develop the legal framework um, to manage their fisheries so that we provide as much consistency between them as possible. It's impossible to be completely consistent because there are different countries members of different RFMOs, and they all have their own objectives and their own principles, and they don't necessarily want to agree by the principles of another RFMO, but we provide that, that support. And slowly through that, you provide a level of um, a mesh that um, provides some consistency and commonality in what the objectives are and what the processes are to manage fisheries sustainably. 
Thanks. That was a, a good description of the overall management system. And I think um, it's important to note that these conflicts sometimes are, um, to, or to observe, is that these conflicts are sometimes from extra pressures, right? Like there's increasing climate change or something else. But just the fact of managing fisheries can create conflict in and of itself. Um, Sarah, maybe you could give us um, a couple of other examples. You recently released a report looking at uh, hotspots of potential conflict in um, fisheries worldwide. Could you just tell us a little bit about what some of the hotspots are that you've noticed will be coming up and, and what the key you know, reasons or issues are underpinning those? Thank you. Yes. Um we, the World Wildlife Fund U.S. office recently released Ocean's Futures, which looks at 20 different hotspots of conflict. It's based on oceanographic and fisheries modeling done by one of our audience members, William Chung, from the University of British Columbia and members of his lab. And we used those data and matched them with other forms of data that cover the socioeconomics, governance, and conflict contents, context at a global scale. So we looked at um, variables that have been identified in studies that were done of causes of fisheries conflict. Um, and we had some important filters or criteria, such as that these data needed to be available globally and that we could aggregate the data in a way that made sense spatially and, and whatnot. And so we looked at um, historical conflict intensity, meaning conflict in a country that had nothing to do with ocean conflict. But we also looked at historical fisheries conflicts we looked at the level of development or GDP in a country. We looked at how many and how intensely different countries were fishing in the waters of a given nation. Um, that was mostly legal fishing because of the means of how we gathered the data. Um, we looked at the existence of disputes over maritime borders, which is a big cause of conflict over fisheries. And we looked at their ability to manage fisheries. So bringing those data together helped us identify um, Hot spots, and we used uh, an anchor point of the year 2030. So we're trying to give some sort of predictive ability to this or, or looking forward at where we see these risks emerging. Um, and I've already mentioned a couple of them, the Horn of Africa and Ecuador. The Western Central Pacific and Central Pacific region had a lot of these, these um, common variables that cause conflicts. Um, the Mediterranean was actually a surprise to me. It wasn't one that was already on my radar as a place that I could expect to see conflict. But when you start to look at some of the, the data very specifically, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, the Arctic was also an area. So we, we were um, a bit bimodal in our thinking of what causes conflict. It's not, not just when fish populations decline, but also in some cases where fish become newly introduced into waters. So where are fish moving into? Where might foreign fleets or, or other fleets start to chase those fish? And what happens when there aren't already governance agreements or, bi or bilateral or multilateral agreements in place to govern those fisheries. So thinking about places where these conflicts might emerge, it's important to think not only about where fish populations are declining, but in some cases where they might be newly introduced. And that's really interesting. I know I, I mean, I'm from Australia and I have direct um, experience of seeing that already that, you know, with tuna migrating and, you know, that weren't you know, in some places where there weren't previously quotas allocated for catching those fish um, or there wasn't management systems in place, there was a real rush to, to harvest those fish. But without a system in place where, you know, really not just potentially causing conflict but potentially going to crash ecosystems and populations, right, or at least potentially going to really negatively impact those, those populations. Um, can you just tell me, can you just tell us a little bit more about, like, for example, the Mediterranean? I mean, there are a lot of people living around the Mediterranean and a lot of people who, uh, you know, it's called uh, Mare Nostrum, I think, uh, in the region. It's our sea. It's very much, uh, you know, not just, um, I mean, it's geologically, ge sorry, geographically very important, but culturally very important. So what, what did you find? Can you just tell us a bit more about the Mediterranean example? What was, how, how would the conflict play out there that you saw? Pick, you picked an example that I actually know very little about historically in the background. Do, do, do you want to Manuel, you jump in there? go ahead, sorry. Because, because it's, it's such a good example. Um, now, you look at the Mediterranean, look at all the countries. If you go country by country, you can see the conflicts, painful conflicts, even speaking 
as today, right? Very significant conflicts in history and has been one of the most overexploited seas historically. But yesterday, the General Fisheries Commission for the Mediterranean, which is an FAO uh, regional body, released the latest sustainability status. And to the surprise of, of many, me included, this, the overfishing in the Mediterranean has declined from, from um, let me just get the numbers, is now 57% uh, overfished, which is a lot, but it was 73% the previous year. So as reduced 15% in a single year. Uh, so that, what, what does that tell you? It tells you that even when there is a lot of conflict, there are some things that sometimes work well. And what is that work well in, the, in that case? Is that that regional fisheries management organization works very well. Politically, the countries may have disagreements, but when they get into the room to discuss fisheries issues, they are all in agreement. Every year they make decisions and every year all the decisions are implemented. So those are fantastic, fantastic example of how conflict alone is not a cause of chaos if it is managed properly. Yeah. Great. And just to continue off on this theme, um, I'm going to ask you, Rashid. So because the Mediterranean is a particularly interesting example, it, has, it is the most overfished sea in the world. So it's great that the level of overfishing has decreased, but it's starting at a very, very depauperate position. And I guess I just want to hand to Rashid in the sense that you work really closely with Daniel Pauly, who coined the phrase shifting baselines. So could you just describe for our listeners what shifting baselines are? Um, and we've seen shifting baselines in Mediterranean. It will become obvious. Um, and also, like... Is this still a relevant term going forward with climate change impacts? Um, yeah, give us your thoughts. That's a very good place to start after Manuel, right? I mean, so you have a system that over time has declined, you know. And what Daniel wrote, he, he would tell you this was one of his most productive papers. He wrote it on a plane flight. It's just five pages, shifting baseline. And the whole idea is, with time, if you start with the biomass of fish like here, the scientists who work on it know it was this year. Then the next group of scientists, another generation, when they come by then, if the fish is here, that's what they will use as their reference point. And then it keeps going. So if you, it was here, and now you, here is your reference point, if you have a little improvement, then you start dancing and celebrating, right? Now the fish has come back, but it's just a fraction. And we see that in the court stocks of Newfoundland. I mean, this is a stock that made many Europeans to go to Canada. The idea was that people could walk on the, on the ocean, so I got to know why Jesus could walk on water. They said the fish biomass was so thick, you could walk on, on the ocean because of that. And today, is, we can get 20,000 tons. And as soon as we see a little, it's like a hockey stick. It's brrr, then you have, oh, they have come. They haven't come. That is shifting baseline. And Manuel just explained that to you. So you have a big decline. Now we see 15% drop. And we're happy. But that is just a small fraction of what it used to be. So that's shifting baseline. And we see it all over, right? It is you have to really get the historical picture before you can be really happy, in my view. Thanks, Rashid. I think it's a really nice, uh, nice example. And just, um, I mean, going forward, just if you have any thoughts on, I mean, warming waters are impacting the productivity of fish populations. Some of them may become more abundant, but I think... The science largely says that they will be decreasing. Um, certainly, size of fish is getting smaller in many places, whether or not that's from overfishing and or from climate impacts. But, you know, considering this new, relatively new <laughs> impact of climate change, one that is quite difficult to predict in all of its different impacts, is the concept of shifting baselines still relevant and important? And how, what's our reference point for our management objectives here and avoiding conflict in fisheries? Oh my gosh. 
You know, climate change makes things worse, everything being equal, frankly speaking, right? The fish move, so some, some places may get more fish, Iceland, Norway, Canada. But like you said, there's also signs showing that the fish are shrink shrinking. When you take the warming, the deoxygenation, you take the acidification all together, all the multiple stresses, they're shrinking and they are moving. And that makes shifting baseline even more relevant. It's faster. So you might even see shifting baselines within a generation, you know, because the fish have gone. And uh, bringing it back to you and to the less developed countries and low-income places, the fish are leaving the equator, if you like, the middle of the up there. And the ethical and moral, and, and it's just, just crazy when you look at it. For Nigeria, for example, we, we estimated there could be a drop of 55% of the catch they get with the worst climate scenario. That is serious. We have malnutrition there. So even if the fish is going to Canada, who cares? People are going to starve where the food is needed. So you have all these linkages that we really need to think about. But yes, shifting baseline is going to be aggravated. It will be faster than it used to be with our climate change. Sadly. Yeah. Manu, I think this is a good time to come back to you in the sense that going forward, um, you know, the Pacific Islands communities, I like to think of them a little bit like the way that we've reframed the ocean from being a victim of climate change to being a solution for climate action. And I think Pacific communities, to me anyway, should be respected for their incredible defence and, um, and solutions-oriented approach because, you know, not only do, are you impacted by the fisheries impacts but obviously sea level and, and so on. What do you think from your position is the most important thing to be doing at this point going forward in terms of addressing these fisheries, these potential areas of conflict for fisheries management and what lessons have you learned from the Pacific that you can share with others? Thank you, Rebecca. And if there is just one uh, message to give, it's cooperation. It is the foundation of success of FFA in its, in its establishment over 40 years ago is, is our people coming together and not seeing the conflicts and the challenges as unsurmountable, but using their platform of cooperation to find solutions. And, and at the start of this conversation, you asked the question, why are fish causing so many problems? In fact, it's not fish, it's people. We are managing people, not fish. And, and so, you know, that's the approach that, that our um, work takes. It's, it's very much people-centered. It's about the people that catch the fish. It's, the, it's about the people who rely on the fish. And you also asked the question about the difference between the impacts on us as, as developing countries as opposed to developed countries. And I used that example of women and, and I go back to that because, you know, our island countries, we don't have other options. The ocean and its resources are our lifeline. And, and that's it for us. And, and for developed countries, obviously more finances, more capacity, more options to, to, to have alternatives uh, given these impacts of climate change. So, you know, um, cooperation, that, that's the only way that our region is able to ensure a safe, secure, and, and, and prosperous home for our people. And, and so when we talk about the conflicts, I, I like to um, reframe that to think about it as challenges that have clear solutions through the platform of cooperation. Thank you. I think that's a really great segue um, because we, we, we talked about, you know, that yet yeah, this is a, a conflict discussion, but actually um, it could be reframed as a an opportunity to create peace, right? Um, and, you know, we've talked about the Russia-Norway COD fisheries agreement uh, in the catch. Um, and it's just one example of treaties and, and management plans. Obviously, the Pacific has great history in this, in, um, in actually addressing these conflicts, but really working hard to 
to find a pathway forward um, by collaborating. Um, Sarah, what do you think can be done to strengthen these management plans going forward to meet the challenges? Let's not frame it as a conflict, let's frame it as a challenge, another challenge in our world to deal with. What can be done to strengthen the systems that we have in place? Well, and I think more specifically, frame it as an opportunity, right? So there's, there's a word for that. Um, conflict scholars talk about conflict prevention, conflict mitigation, and conflict transformation. I believe what Manu is talking about is conflict transformation. And what Manuel started with is saying that conflict, we shouldn't be afraid of conflict, right? It, pres it brings people to the table. It um, provides these opportunities for conversation, particularly around transboundary resources that, that move and are shared, and that through regional fisheries management organizations, for example, um, can, can bring people together. And I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about it. I mean, there are obviously times when the parties don't come to the table, or a party leaves the room when, when they were there to, to begin with. So, um, but conflict transformation principles assume that we do have opportunities when conflict happens to rise above that conflict and find better solutions. And so we um, at WWF were thinking about the ways in which understanding the context in which we work can be applied to improving management principles. Um, and you know, the, the conflicts that happen, happen everywhere in the world for different reasons, but in general, bringing people together to have those open conversations, and in particular, when there is equitable consideration of the people in the room and around the table, and making sure that women are invited to the conversation, that the private sector is invited to the conversation, that there is a diversity of voices um, that are contributing to management solutions is, is one way to think about it. And I see, this is one thing that gives me hope. I see at COP, I see in regional fisheries management organizations, I see at the FAO, I see in the fisheries management approach of my own country, the United States, the, the growing, rapidly growing awareness that engaging directly with fishing communities is the only way to do it. And we do have some scientific support for that. Um, in a, a database that I built a few years ago, we looked at the causes of fisheries conflict in six different countries and what caused conflicts to become less intense. And it was the countries in which cooperative approaches to management or participatory management that engaged communities in cooperation with the government at both the state and the federal levels to um, bring into place not only their knowledge, but their perspectives and their interests. Really, they're the best advocate for their own interests. That type of management led to less conflict over those management issues. And so this is not a new principle. Cooperative management has been around for a long time. We've, it's successfully been used in many different places. But I think that applying those principles more broadly, and to some fisheries where cooperative management is very challenging, such as tuna, right, where you don't always have, uh, it's not just coastal communities, but also distant water fishing nations, and then industrial scale, scale boats as well, um, could be one way that we could strengthen management. So I think that that's a really good, um, just working off that last point about the fact that we're not just talking about small communities or local artisanal fishers here, we're actually talking about some pretty big players. The fishing trade, the fishing industry globally has some, some really big wealthy companies, right? It's not just your individual individuals going out in their small, small boats. And so the reason I am hooking on to that is in some of those situations, in the negotiation situations, say when you're coming to these co-management discussions, um, they have a different driver to your local communities. How can citizens and community and uh, you know communities be informed or engaged around this issue to help perhaps? Um, align some of the ambition for some of those bigger industrial players because, you know, they have a different agenda to, to the local communities, but fish and the health of our fisheries uh, is an issue and a responsibility and a right and, and a concern for all of citizens. So is there, is there a place for communication of this issue for citizens and, and consumers? 
Absolutely, and for consumers, I think it's very confusing oftentimes to know what's the best choice to make at the grocery store or in a restaurant. But I think the heart of your question is, is, can I kick it to you, Manu? Because I think that that's exactly what the FFA does, is represent those diverse interests. So maybe I can pass the question to you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Rebecca. You know, um, when, when you asked that question, the first thing that popped into my mind is, is bringing, bringing those relevant stakeholders together and ensuring that they share on, because everyone comes with their own interests, and, and making sure that you, you take the time to understand those various interests, that's how the FFA works. You know, it, it's absolutely correct what Sarah says. Not, they, they won't agree all the time, and, and that's fine. We embrace national positions, we embrace sub-regional positions, because I firmly believe that strong parts of our region make a stronger region. And having the space, creating the time to listen to each other, just, I, 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 I do think that over time, you know, the way FFAs work is, is we eventually find consensus on even the stickiest of issues because of that respect for each other and making time to really understand uh, the different interests. And our countries range from some of the smallest, which are, say, less than 2,000 people in the population, to Papua New Guinea and even Australia and New Zealand with you know millions of people in their population. So varying um, stages of development, and, and they bring all of that to the table because they have this one shared common commodity of a uh, renewable resource, which is the tuna, which binds everyone. And you know, it's been such a, a privilege with nearly uh, 19 years at FFA to observe just how our people continue to come together, to work together, to achieve together. And it always comes back to people and why we do what we do and why we must cooperate. The people, the people, the people. The people and the fish. <laughs> Thank you, Manu. Um, so just sticking on the kind of going to the big global level, we've seen and, and talking about this from a from a conflict transition perspective, um, perhaps we've seen some really big breakthroughs in the last few years when it comes to international agreements um, and cooperation to protect our oceans. So just this year we've had the agreement on the High Seas Treaty. Uh, we've also recently had the World Trade Organization subsidies agreement. Um, Rashid, I'm going to kick it to you. How do you think these multilateral agreements help in our response to changing fish migration patterns and a warming climate? Yeah, I think they're, they're great. They're good. They help, right? I mean, coming together and getting an agreement. The WTO, the WTO subsidies, for example, I like it because before that happened, I thought the world could never agree on anything if you see the argument and the fight. So we can actually agree. That alone is a plus. The high seas, great stuff, because when we started talking about the high seas and management, our group at UBC, there was zero MPA at the IC. Now we have, as far as I know, two to three percent, the Ross Sea, for example, and a bit of the Arctic. And if the high seas agreement is implemented, we could get 30 percent close. So that is progress. But it's not near where I will want. You know this. Those of you who have heard me, from all our research, from what we know, looking at the economics, looking at the climate impact of high seas fishing, looking at the biodiversity thing and the equity aspects, the best thing for the world to do is to close the damn high sea from fishing. Just close it up. And that will, I know the RFMOs are doing a good job. Uh, some of them are doing well, but not all of them. There's scientific literature that has done rankings of this. Some of them really don't do well. It's just, because, you know, when, when you do that, if we are brave enough to share the high seas to fishing, then we can concentrate on managing the country waters, the EEZ, that Manuel talk, as much as possible. And why is that a good thing? Because at the moment, we take about 4 to 8% from our estimate 
of, of the total global catch from the high seas, mainly tunas. And the tunas go in and out. They don't just stay in the high seas. The only fishes that live all their life in the high seas are very special fishes, very delicate. They live very long, some of them up to 400 years. I, I just learned about this uh, Greenland shark. Lives up to 400. So they live so long, they, are, they have names like people. Alfonsino. Mr. Alfonsino is a fish. And I tell people, anything that can live as old as your grandma and your grandpa, just leave them alone. Why do you want to eat grandma and grandpa? Don't leave. So they will be protected. But the tunas will come, will catch them cheaply, right? Small countries will be able to catch them. Guinea-Bissau, when they come in, rather than China, Japan, Spain, taking it all, right? So there's an equity angle. Man, Manuel, can you join me? Let's close the high seas to fishing. He smiles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's one solution, concrete one, really. And, and the science actually backs us up. And I know how you look at it. Anyway. Manuel is on his <laughs> I better let Manuel have a go here. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, the problem is that neither I or Rashid, or anyone in this world can do that. And that is where the rubber meets the road, is that it doesn't matter what your personal feelings are. The, th think, the thing is, this is a world of you know, 200 and plus countries, and you cannot tell a country not to go to the high seas. Right? You can't tell it. You can't tell them. It is in the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea that it is open to countries. And they will. So in my, my job, my focus is on managing. Because I know that I cannot tell people to stop doing something, but I know I can tell them what to, how to do it well. Uh, and you know, we, are, we are mixing in this conversation a lot about conflict and sustainability and the way com completely together and connected. And they are, they are connections. But you know, sustainability failures are governance failures. And they are very complex. And very often, the reasons for those failures are because countries and institutions have different objectives when they look at fish. And we just touched a little bit on it, right? But for some countries, uh, the ocean should be uh, a mechanism to improve um, labor, to make sure that there, is, there are jobs for as many people as possible. For some countries, it is to ensure that you get the most economic a return out of that investment. For some countries, is to make sure that you feed your people as much as you can. Those three are not completely consistent objectives. And so a country might decide to go through a particular management system because it fits one objective but not another. And that leads to conflict. And when it comes to our FMOs, the ones that do not work well do not work well for that very reason because the countries that are part of it they have different objectives, and they can't quite agree. But the solution is not to say, well, you can't, you know, we close the door, because no one has the key. So the only way is to say, we keep on bringing you to the table. We keep on showing to you, and that's why I showed one good example, actually, of sustainability. Because you have to, first of all, demonstrate to people that are good solutions, and that management works. Because if we don't demonstrate that management works, why are they going to worry about it? So it's important to show the examples of success. Look, the US, 6% overfishing federal stocks. Tuna, uh, globally, 15% overfished. You know, those are good examples. There are terrible examples out there, you know? The good examples allow us to bring to the other countries and say, look, you know, th there is something that you can gain by becoming more sustainable from an ecological perspective, you know, and let's take care of the social and economic perspective at the same time. So I don't know whether that makes sense, but it is a way of saying that, you know, this is not an easy solution. There are no easy solutions out there, yeah. and you know that. <laughs> Please, I just need to. You know, Manuel, and all you said makes sense, right? But clearly, this is why we, we need universities, and we need managers like Manuel, right? Frankly speaking, all he said is right. In his position, he's supposed to help countries make whatever the best they can do, given their interest in everything. But in my position, I can tell people what to do. They can ignore it. That's okay also. But I can, and that is what I'm paid to do. That's what my service is. I tell you, 
and, and it's not feeling uh, manually. This is not feeling. It's data. We crunch data. We model to be able to say this. We even calculated the Gini coefficient. If you close the high C versus what we are doing now, you know what? At the moment, the countries that fish there, the distribution of the income from the high seas is the worst distribution of any country in the world. But if you close the high seas, the Gini coefficient improves by 100%. So we will turn the high seas benefit from South Africa, which is the most, the most unequal in income country in the world, and you know why it's appetite. And I actually, when people were talking about appetite, we were told that you can't tell them what to, what to do, right? But we did tell them, and they changed. We would all be in a smoked room here with smoke all over us. When people started, the scientists said, smokes, the secondhand smoking is harmful. People tell them, you can't tell anybody that. And we did, and we took away the... So it's more hopeful than you think. But I respect your position because really, you have to do your best. And I have to tell people how to look higher and higher and improve the world. Okay, sir. Yeah. You know, that was beautiful. Can I, can I say something? Just quickly. I just... No, just a very quick... You know, because I'm an academic too, like, like Rashid, right? Uh, so I understand that. And I, there is this, this joke, you know, this, you can say that uh, scientists, academics often think that if everyone knew what they know, they will think like they think. But that's never the case, right? And, you know, you, your, your job, of course, is to provide the best information possible and educate students to get the best information possible. And as you know, there are many different academics working on the highest fisheries uh, than you. But at the end of the day, we all have the same job. Uh, the, the same job, because the, the, the job is to actually make sure that fisheries remain sust or become sustainable, or some of them remain sustainable. From the data collection, to the management, to the negotiations. And we are all in the same team here. Okay, so we're going to have to wrap it up shortly, but that was beautiful. This is the kind of discussions that you can really have uh, when you really start to crack into the details. And I think a couple of key points that I've just, you know, want to touch on there or reflect on. One is values. You, you know, what you're talking about, Manuel, is like there's knowledge and then there's values. And it's a little bit like, as Manu, you were discussing, bringing people into the room, pushing through negotiations, making sure you're uh, speaking to people's values. And the other thing that I really wanted to highlight was ambition. And we're all sitting here in the UNFCCC climate conference, and a lot of us still have the ambition that we're going to stop climate change or limit it to one and a half degrees, but the current approach is pushing us way closer to three degrees warming. So let's maintain ambition. I believe we should aim high. So I'm just going to ask Sarah and Manu to, because the guys had a good, good go there, if you could um, leave us with uh, one, um, one closing moment or comment on, on what gives you hope going forward with this. Thanks. Uh, what gives me hope were conversations like the two of them just had, because that's a microcosm of the conversation we're having here at COP, right? What are the competing interests and how do we align them to all pull in the same direction? And as Manuel just said, we're all on the same team. And for the most part, everyone at COP is on the same team. We're all aiming for the same thing. We just need to figure out the best way to do it. So why I am optimistic and have hope is because we have academics, we have members of the private sector and representing the fishing industries. We have our managers, and I'm representing civil society in the NGO world. And all of us are sitting together here having the conversation about the best solutions. And I don't think the world was like that 20 years ago. And so I think that we have recognized that we live in a very complex world and that we have to have holistic ways of thinking about it that center the needs of people who are closest to the resource. And I see that with the climate march for justice that just happened a few hours ago and the understanding that that is so important and what we need to center. Thank you. Mani? Thank you. Keep people front of mind of everything we do and, and we know we can achieve these targets that, that, we, that we're seeking and, and can genuinely uh, pursue and achieve them. Get back on track with 
embed fisheries and oceans into the COP agenda, ensure that our developing countries have access to adequate finance and also access in a timely manner. Wonderful, that's a really great close. So a huge thanks to our amazing panelists. That was a really fascinating discussion. And thank you everyone online for joining us for this live podcast taping of The Catch. Make sure to listen and subscribe to the whole series wherever you get your podcasts. And a final huge thank you to Foreign Policy and the Walton Family Foundation. And look forward to new episodes coming soon. I'm Rebecca Hubbard. Thank you.